All right, we're just going to go ahead and get started. Can everybody hear me without a microphone? I know it's a little bit loud in here. Um, and I have an interesting lesson. So this will be an interesting tidbit for some of you. Some of you might already know this, but I'm actually doing a lesson on the mother of Jesus. Okay, well, we're not in Israel. We're not in Bethlehem. We are just leaving Ephesus, so why marry the mother Jesus? Well, the reason is because according to church tradition, um, that Mary followed the Apostle John back to Ephesus, where she spent the last days, thus period of her life there in Ephesus. We don't know if that's true or not. She would have been quite old if she was, because the Apostle John came around 66 AD. And if you do the math, if Jesus was born around 5 BC, we're getting close to 90. Did Mary move to Ephesus with the Apostle John when she was almost 90? Well, we know she has a history of learning how to live on the move. It's possible. So, but that is church tradition. Uh, but I really wanted us to take a look at her journey. And I've taught on Mary, the mother of Jesus, and I bet you, I suspect a lot of you have as well. Either heard messages on Mary, the mother of Jesus, or done them yourself. Um, and But... What I've learned over the years, and even more recently, I've always thought, yes, of course he chose Mary, because when you read about her in the scriptures, you think she's so amazing. She must be 15, 16, somewhere between 14 and 16 was the age of betrothal. And then when you, she comes out with this magnificat, you know, and, and, and the beginning of Luke, you think, wow, for, for such a young woman to have such great faith, to have, uh, to have knowledge of lofty ideas like the proud and the inmost thoughts and things like that, of course, that's why God chose her, because she was so faithful, because she was so courageous, that's why. But I've learned since then, as it's not probably why God chose her. It was not probably based on her merit, her faith, or even her courage. It wasn't about Mary, it was about Jesus. And I want to take you a little bit through part of her journey. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. As you're turning there, I'm just going to begin reading the first part of Luke, written by, um, by tradition of, the, of Luke. And he writes, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an ordinary account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And then we go on, we're gonna read about the birth of Jesus. How the angel came and talked to Mary. Well, how did Mary was the only one there outside of Gabriel? What he says, how does he learn these things? How did she was an eyewitness of these things? She told her story. And it was a story meant to be told. And it was her journey. And and I wanna take you on her journey, and we're not gonna go through the whole thing. Um, but I'm gonna read a few things about her life. Um, if you read through the whole count of Luke chapter 1 and 2. You'll read about the angel Gabriel coming to her, uh, which is interesting because when the angel came and came to different people over time, sometimes they fell to the ground, sometimes they were frozen. She has this discourse with an angel, and I think, oh, she's so courageous. Um, but what's interesting is the angel, if you, um, Luke 1, starting in verse 26 it says in the sixth month god sent the angel gabriel to nazareth a town in galilee some obscure little town in the middle of nowhere to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named joseph a descendant of david the virgin's name was mary the angel went to her and said greetings you who are highly favored the lord is with you highly favored you read about some of these things um a little bit later, he says, in verse uh, 28 and 30, he says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor. That's Luke 1. Um, and it's interesting, when he says you have found favor, the word favor here is charis. Which a lot of you might know means the word grace. You have found grace. 
Mary, you are highly favored and found grace. And then when you read in her own account, and keep reading down in Mary's song in, in Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 6, 46, it says, And Mary said, this is the great Magnificat that uh, she prophesies, and she says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations, all generations, here we are, how many years later, will call me blessed. Well, what's interesting, this word blessed is not the same word that Gabriel uses. Gabriel used the word charis, which is found favor. The one here is makirio, which means more fortunate, make happy. And Mary, when she... When she prophesizes these words, I don't know how much she understood. When you read through the rest of this song, um, verse 49, For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And then here she starts something which is pretty significant. But I'm not sure how much she knew until later. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. For sure she has known that, heard those stories. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. Lofty ideas for a teenage girl. He has brought down rulers from the thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Here starts the reversal of things that we hear all through the scriptures. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Reversal. He has helped the servant of his remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Did Mary understand who this God was that she worshipped? Was she was going to? And perhaps when she thought of being the Messiah's, the mother of the Messiah, which every girl of Israel would have thought, could it be me? Could it be me? And here she is, the most highly favored and blessed. But God is going to rewrite the word highly favored and blessed for us. When I think blessed, I think the word happy. I think that's literally what I think it means. Blessed means happy. Have a blessed day. Happy. And, and Jewish thought was very similar at the time when Mary used that word, even in the Magnific Magnificat, when, when she said, I will be blessed, highly blessed among all, for generations and generations to come. They would have thought fortunate. You know, when you read in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 59, kind of like the reversal of things to come, was like, you'll have more land and more children. You'll be blessed. But what did this mean to her? What did it look like? Let's take a little journey, and I'm going to review some of these things. In fact, the last time we see Mary in the New Testament, which is, which is in Acts chapter 1, when she's with the apostles, and she's waiting in faith. She's waiting for the, the promise to be fulfilled. And we see this faithful, mature woman in Acts chapter 1. But let's go back to the girl, the one. Let's talk about the Gabriel coming to visit her. And what she has to face. What does highly favored and blessed mean? Being scorned by her village, being looked at sideways and being suspicious. And then what next? Then she would take an almost 100-mile trip to Bethlehem in her third trimester pregnancy. If you've ever been pregnant, third trimester, pushing on the bladder. I don't know, was she with Joseph along? Was she with a clan of people that had to go back? 100 miles. That would have taken probably a week, maybe even slower at her stage. I have a nephew, and a nephew who has taken an unusual path and has decided to become a wanderer. I don't know if Kelly got to meet him when he came to church the one time, but you wouldn't have missed him because they smell different. They wander, literally. They don't take showers. They do their hair, and it's all matted down, and they wander. They came in barefoot. I said, at least let me put some shirts on you <laughs> because they're kind of in rags. But they just decide they're going to love people and be happy and give blessings to everybody along their way and probably some bad things, too, that make them happy, uh, not in a godly way. But they wander. They just wander. And I was like, ooh, I can't imagine 
wandering. Well, they weren't wandering. They had a direct goal. But what it would have been like on this travel without the showers, without you getting your hair done and, and change your... I don't know what she would have had with her, but a long trip. Does this sound highly favored? But she, when she heard God is now going to send this Messiah, everything's going to change, right? It's not going to be Herod in charge anymore. We're going to have a Messiah to deliver us. But here, here it is sending her on this 100-mile trip to, for the census. Couldn't God reverse that? But then she was highly favored and she was blessed. And then, what next? She would give birth to her firstborn. And anybody who has had a firstborn knows the difficulty of firstborn baby. It's usually the toughest one, the longest one, with anesthesia. And where was he born? We're not exactly sure. Could be in a cave, could be in the front room of a house, but the thing we know for sure, there were animals there. And when there's animals there, what else is there? Poop, sweat, flies, gnats, all the stuff that goes along with animals. The king of the Jews, our Messiah, will be born amongst the flies and the poop and the stench. The reversal of things. And then what next? What next? She hears in the middle of the night, Joseph waking her up. We got to flee. We got to leave everything you've known. Not that it was hard enough to do all of that. And now you're back. You're finally settled. And then you got to go to where? Where? Back to Egypt. What's Egypt? Egypt. Where they fled from. That's not the promised land. That's going backwards. You remember somebody else who left Egypt and then went back to, to go and deliver with Moses. Here she going back. And it probably wasn't Eastern Egypt, where some, the Jews probably were at that point were on the western in, in Alexandria. Even further, at least 80 miles, probably more. In the middle of the night with what a baby? Is this highly favored or blessed? To God it is. And then what next? What else? What other vignettes do we have? We have the vignette of Mary doing the right thing, right? She's done all these things. She's obeyed. She's fled. She's listened. She's done all these things. And then here she is going to the temple to go and worship, bringing her family. This is the right thing to do, obeying good girl Mary, living out this life. Their day's journey out. Where's Jesus? And if you've ever lost, I've lost a child maybe for, oh gosh, less than a minute. <laughs> and I just, in those minutes, I remember turning around and Caleb was right behind me in a parking lot. And I was putting my groceries in like this and I turned around and he was completely gone. He had wandered across to where they put the carts in. He wanted to play with the carts. It wasn't very far, but I remember that. <gasps> Where's my son in a parking lot? Did somebody yeah. come and take him while I turned my back for what seconds? I can't imagine. It took three days before they found him. Three days. Here she was. She knew how special he was. Can you imagine? It wasn't just losing a child. She lost the son of God for three days. Do you think she slept? I can't imagine she slept. I think she was going from, you know, from tent to tent or wherever, like just frantically looking for her son. Think of the anxiety and the pain, the suffering of those three days. Anything! As each hour went by, day after day, until she finds him. And then she finds him? Oh, I'm so sorry, Mom. I didn't mean to make you worry. No. What do we get? Not an apology. I'm going down to the verse because it's much better when he says, um, after three days they found him in a temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. This is Luke chapter 2, verse 46. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. 
And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Something's happening here to Mary. She did take this baby infant and run and save his life through the angel who told them to flee to Egypt. But now something's switching. It's that Jesus is now in control. But Mary is trying to be the protective mom, but she's got to outgrow being the mother of the Son of God to the disciple of the Son of God. And then later, when Jesus is in his full ministry, oh my goodness, that protective mom doesn't go away. No matter what age you are, even when you're grandparents, you still want to take care of your kids and protect them. It's just the way God has made us. But Mary would be discipled by Jesus one more time. In Mark chapter 3, verse 21, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, He is out of his mind. And then later in the same chapter, uh, Mark 3, verse 31, says, And his mother and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Again, she's discipled by Jesus. And what's happening? Again, Jesus is transforming her perspective. You know, we think Jesus is going to show up on the mountain in the middle of nature. But no, Jesus showed up to Mary where? In the barn, amongst the animals. Because why? God is the God of stink. The God of mess, the God of noise, the God of dirt, the God of discomfort, God of the barn. You know, you think about all through the scriptures, when do people meet God? Job encounters God in a storm, sitting on an ash heap. Abraham encounters God outside the wicked city of Sodom in the heat of the day. Jacob entered God alone in the darkness in the middle of the night. Moses entered God and encountered God in the wilderness on the far side of the desert. Elijah encountered God in the cave while running for his life, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the fire, and Mary encounters Jesus, God, in a stable, a redeemer, in rags. It doesn't make sense. Right. But it's not supposed to. Yeah. It's not our sense. It's God's bigger sense. Yeah. And God, so often, we feel like we need to make explanations for what God is doing in our lives. Don't we sometimes in the yeah. lives of us around us? Yeah. We we spat out platitudes or deny the strangeness of what's really going on. We say, it's not really that bad. God is good all the time. I'm good. I have nothing to complain about. God is good. But God is not a God of explanation and excuses. He's the God of the manger. He's the God who sent Abraham to Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son. This is our God. We can't make excuses. We've got to wrestle with these things. Yeah. A book that I've been reading um, that Tess Fontenot had recommended uh, was Wrestling with Wonder. Um, and it's this journey of Mary where a lot of what I'm talking about comes from. And talking about so much of life doesn't make sense. But it's not supposed to. Because if it makes sense, then we don't have to wrestle with wonder to find out who God really is because we don't know him without this. It's not about our lives. It's about his life for us. Because when we encounter Jesus, everything changes. It's no longer our life, our will. It's his life and his will. And it doesn't look anything like what we plan. Why? Because it's his plan. And we can't fight that. We've got Well, we do. We wrestle. We wrestle to surrender to that. And Luke chapter 2 with Simeon you know, she, she's told by Gabriel she's highly favored and blessed. She recants that. I am going to be blessed among all nations. Then Simeon says, and a sword will pierce through your own soul. What was he saying? What did she think? She said he'll be the rise and the fall of Israel, that he'll be opposed. Wait a minute. He's the Messiah. What do you mean Israel will oppose him? He's the Israel. What 
did this even make sense to Mary? But Mary was called to suffer, but not for suffering's sake, but for purpose, for revelation. Through suffering, the thoughts of our hearts are revealed. And only then, because we have to dig deep when we face pain, when we face incongruency, things that don't make sense to us, that's when our true hearts get exposed. And if our truths don't get exposed, we can never really deal with them, have the intimacy that God has always wanted us to be with him and know who he is. We are not called to suffer for suffering's sake, but for a purpose. And that purpose is for revelation, to know God. You know, Mary had to be, once again, after Jesus was born, the refugee in a new country. Left everything she knew. On top of everything else, goes to Egypt. For who knows how long? Back to the land of slavery. Favored? Really? Blessed? Highly blessed? Really? Mary had to learn it wasn't about the mountaintop, it was about the journey. The journey is where you find God. It's not on the top and the light, but it's actually in the dark. And then ultimately, we know the story where she was led. Led to the foot of the cross. Her worst nightmare. And when you care about somebody, when you've seen, I can't imagine having a perfect child. It's beyond my imagination. But I imagine she had so many memories of him laughing and singing and taking care of people and being so kind and generous. And she would have just, oh, wanted to protect him and build him up. And, and then, again, to submit once more was at the foot of the cross. Perhaps I, when she... When she went out to take charge of him, she knew the tension was building, and she knew I had to go in and protect him because she was mom. And Jesus had a reminder against me. No. Because my mother is going to be the one that's doing his will. It's not about the blood. It's about the spirit. Jesus calls her to lay down her will, to become a disciple, and doing so to submit to his will. I can't imagine what she was praying as he came in and there was more tension growing and please protect him God please protect him you you saved him you brought him out of Egypt but then all these children lost their lives I bet she she sat next to mothers who had lost their lives as she escaped to to Egypt and the pain everything she went through and now here God protect him again he's the Messiah this is what you told me I heard this as he was arrested protect him release him as he was taken before. Has when she's like, Pilate's about ready to release one. This is it. This is how God's gonna work. He's gonna be released. And then they shot Barabbas. And then she's praying again. And then perhaps as he's flogged in the agony, why does she have to be there? Could she have been at home? Everything could have changed. Why did God allow her to be there, to see all this, to go through this, to have this, literally the piercing of her soul? I can't imagine. Perhaps she thought, now, because he'll survive the flogging and, and then to hear the sounds and what that would have felt like. I can't imagine the pain as people yell, crucify him, crucify him. The piercing of her soul. Why so much pain? Sometimes going into Jesus, sitting at his feet, letting go of our expectations, submitting to him, leads us to a place we don't want to go. Yeah. And these are the places where we must face our worst fears. Think of all the prayers of the Bible. Jonah prayed for judgment on Nineveh. Nineveh was, uh, hor they were horrible to Israelites. Oh, take them down, God. And God did not take heed a righteous man's prayer, but told him to go in and tell them to repent. Paul, the apostle Paul said, take this thorn from me. He probably thought I could do more, I could move faster, I could do whatever it was. Maybe it's his eyesight. I always thought it was maybe his eyesight, you know, or migraines or whatever. He could perform more, do more for God. But God said no. And Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane says, please take this cup from me. And God said no. Why? Because it wasn't about them. It was about us. I'm so 
inspired by a good friend of mine, Sheila Weir, in the Hampton Roads Church. In fact, this the last time uh, I was on uh, in the on a Holy Land tour in Israel, I got news from afar. It was when we were in Israel t uh, just two years ago, about this time, when I was sitting at a buffet and someone came up to me and said, Sheila Weir has just been diagnosed with terminal disease that had given her a year to live. And she was somebody that was a dear friend. She had young kids, uh, three and, uh, well, I think uh, Riley was about four and uh, Alex was probably four or five, six at the time. Um, I just felt like I couldn't breathe. I know she had been contacting me, asking me for some medical input, and they were treating her for allergies and didn't make all sense. And who would have thought that such a young, beautiful, righteous woman would have something like amyloidosis, how rare. Something that, it, it, it acts like cancer, it takes over every part of your body. And it was shutting down her heart. And so far away. But as I've watched Sheila, now she is still alive today. In fact, she's in Boston right now. She says she has maybe some hopeful news. Although she's not putting it out there yet because she doesn't want to keep raising people's expectations. So I know this is being recorded. But, but I've watched her wrestle with this wonder. And in a real way, not making excuses for God, but going there. But God, why me? I don't understand. Just let me watch my daughter grow up and become a disciple. Let me see my son study the Bible. Let me see them be married. Let me, let me become a grandmother. I've done everything right. I've, done, I've, I've, done, I've seen her wrestle with all honesty and integrity the way God wants to, the way Mary had to. She was forced to face her fears and understand who God was. What does it mean to be highly favored and blessed? It doesn't mean what we think it naturally means. And guess what, sisters? You are highly favored and blessed. But what does that mean? I remember right after I became a Christian, I was older, I was 29 years old when I studied the Bible and became a Christian. And not too long after that, a few months later, um, I think it was definitely less than a year old as a, as a disciple, I started building with a brother. Everyone thought, oh, it's going to be great. He's, he's leading a family group. He's very spiritual. And, um, and everyone felt great about it. And we started emailing back and forth. And I'd go up to see him. He comes at like both. And then I remember going up to D.C. And he's like, well, that'd be a really good hospital for somebody to work at someday. And I'm thinking, oh. And then he says, and I'm really good at, you know, reaching out to parents. And I'm thinking, oh, he's going to help my parents know who Jesus is. I'm, this, this is perfect. That's on a Friday, then the following Tuesday, but he had a previous relationship. The, the sister that had helped him come to know God um, was uh, up in Boston, and, and she, she, he, she was a single mom, and he wanted to get together with her so we could kind of let her know that he was moving on for sure. I mean, he had told her, but he wanted to make sure, so they were doing it in person. So I'm like, oh, gosh, I hope this is going to be painful. And uh, So I'm praying, and then on Tuesday, I'm like, I wonder how it went. I hope he's okay. Um, call him up and he's like, went awesome, it's so great. Oh my gosh, we're so much in love. And I thought, wait a minute, this isn't supposed to happen in the kingdom of God. This never happened in the world. It was always mutual in the world. I thought, I was totally blindsided. I had no idea. And they did end up together and did neither of them stayed faithful immediately after the wedding. They both walked away. I knew God had protected me, but in that moment I thought, wait a minute. This is the kingdom of God. We're supposed to love each other. Build each other. I'm like, no, this isn't happening. Through all, the, and then getting married late, and then getting pregnant, and then thinking, oh, I'm so excited to share this with my husband. And my husband's like, oh, okay, here we go. He already had two sons. I wasn't super excited. I was like, oh, oh no. It was like, okay, and then I lost that baby, and I get pregnant again. Okay, but he's more excited because he's realized that this is important to us <laughs> as one. Amen. And it's twins. I'm like, I can't believe it. God has blessed it again. Okay, it's been hard, but okay. And then, lost the twins. And I think, okay, I'm older. I think there's a reason God is good. He loves me and he's involved in my life. And those 
the three things even when I was grieving. I got, okay, I know God is good. I know he loves me. I know he's about, I thought perhaps if I had a child, I wouldn't stay faithful. Perhaps I would be, would grow up and not be Christian. It would hurt me more. I didn't know what to think. I just knew it was really, really painful. Trying to come up with an explanation instead of just wrestling with wonder. And of course, I did get pregnant, was able to have children. And it felt like blessings. But then there's special needs. And then there's this and that. And and then there's the son that, you know, you raise him up as the way you should. And in the end, well, it's not the end yet because they're not, one of them's not coming back. And then the pain of somebody turning away from everything you've taught them since they were a toddler. The pain. And we think, we should expect this. Not only should we expect it, but we've got to wrestle with who God is. These are the times we need to crave and come into. We actually have to go towards the pain because it is what will change. One of my favorite passages, don't turn there, I'll read it, it's in Habakkuk. I love, it's one of my favorite minor prophets because you see this prophet wrestling. First, he's like, God, won't you do something? Your, your people are not listening to me. I've been talking. It's kind of like when, when you look to your... You know, if you're married, you look to your husband, and you have children, you're like, will you do something? They're not listening to me. Well, back then, it's kind of like that with God. Do something. And then God says, oh, trust me, I'm doing something. I'm going to bring in these Chaldeans, and they're going to do it. No, 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 that, not that. Would you choose something unrighteous to go and punish something more righteous? That doesn't make sense. And then finally, God gets him to the point of surrender. And how does he end? It's shocking how he gets himself to a place back up. I gotta go backwards here. Come on, Dad. Should have put some. Ah, guys, here we go. Habakkuk. After he reminds himself of all the things, the great wonders of what God has done, it's like how does he get there? He reminds himself who God is and what he's capable of. And then at the very end, in Habakkuk chapter three. In verse 17, he says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, and there's no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The Savior of the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. He enables me, and this is the part I love, he enables me to go on the heights. And what I think he's talking about is it gave him a different perspective. When you're up high, you have a different perspective up on the heights. And through suffering, we get a different perspective of who we are, who God is, and and the honesty of who we are and the honesty of who God is, we can have that true intimacy that God has created us to have. One of the most wonderful and tender moments in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the nightmare, and the one that loves, I always get emotional when I think about this part, is Jesus hanging on the cross. In agony, we can't even fathom. We can't even fathom the physical pain. We can't fathom the spiritual pain of, of the, uh, the evilness of the pavement of our sins inside of them. We can't even, we, we have consciousness. We know what we feel like. We feel dirty, but the, the, the sins of all mankind inside of us. And the emotions of the people he created in love, because each one of us is created by Jesus himself, the creator of the universe. And us turning against him, all of the emotional, the physical, the spiritual pain, and he's there in the mist, and there's Mary, just one obscure mom in the crowd, thinking, does he even know who I am? What role am I? And he says, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. This is John, and from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. That's why we're talking about Mary and Ephesus, because John came here. That he does remember us in the worst of the worst. He remembers one woman, one obscure rural woman, and her pain. And she would never forget that moment. And then of course, she goes on to see him raised from the dead. He becomes her savior. We find her in Acts chapter 1, faithful to God, waiting for the promise. But Mary had to go on this journey. 
She didn't meet God on the mountaintop. She met him in a barn. She met him on the way to Egypt. She met him at the temple, and she met him at the foot of the cross. And that's how we will encounter God. And we have to glory as, as we embrace the suffering, as we embrace our journeys, and as we expect our journeys, when we encounter Jesus, everything changes. Yeah. But we can go to the heights and have this joy that you've never experienced before. Amen. Amen.